When you donate your organs, it's not a, it's not a profit machine. When you donate your tissues, a portion of the money that, that the tissue bank made when they sold my daughter's tissues went into the pocket of the CEO so he can have his, you know, I don't know, vacation home in the Caymans or drive his Jaguar or whatever it is. And that's, that's not what I want my legacy and what I want my, my tissues going for. Tissue donation, we're recovering skin, bones, tendons, um, heart valves, veins, those sorts of things. There's a huge variety of, of different products that can be made from donated tissue. Everything from whole use of the heart valves and veins to cortical wedges and bone paste for used for, for dental. And, and there's bone screws, there's plates. The tendons can be used as a medical device. It's regulated as a medical device. It's, it's no longer part of Uncle John. It's, a, it's product XYZ123. This is not about organs, but about so-called tissue. Everything worth recycling is removed from the corpses. Bones, muscles, tendons. Often even the skin is removed from the bodies. Worldwide, millions of body parts are turned into medical products every year. For example, granules for jawbone reconstruction or implants for spinal surgery. Ukrainian bones are best sellers in the West. In the Ukraine, pathologists are accused of harvesting body parts under scandalous circumstances. On the day of the funeral, I saw that my son had cuts on his wrists, very deep cuts. And my husband said that they had cut out body parts. In court, we learned that they had sold body parts as anatomical material. Human beings don't do such things, taking advantage of our tragedy. They make money with our misfortune. Uh, what we know is that there are over two million allografts that are distributed uh, in the United States every year. Here's what we don't know about tissue. Where it comes from or where it goes, if it's obtained legally, or even how many people get sick. Some donor families don't even know how much they're giving away. Whoa. Oh, Mandy, my name's Dana, and I'm with the California Transplant Donor Network on a recorded line. I know that you spoke with one of my colleagues regarding a tissue donation with your dad. The body is carefully reconstructed after recovery. But then we went Thursday for our private viewing, my mom and I, and we went in to check him out and make sure that he was dressed nice and looked nice and his hands were bleeding. So she went out and got our funeral director. And, and he said, we didn't receive his body the way that they should have received it. That he was so upset by it that he took photographs and wrote a letter to the donor network. I have been a mortician for nearly 30 years and have seen an awful lot of bodies in horrid condition, but this was by far the worst donor body I have ever seen. To say this was simply a hack job would be a compliment. This case clearly was not treated with any level of dignity or respect. This was purely a harvest and cast off. And yes, that is his severed foot in the photo to the bottom left of the embalming table. It had not been reattached, but did have the toe tag, which was ever so helpful. That is not what I consented to. I wanted my dad back whole in one piece so he could wear his shoes and he could be dressed properly. And he's not. He wasn't. When my two-year-old daughter, Alyssa, died, um, we had the, the good fortune of being able to donate her organs and tissues. Her organs saved the life of another little girl, Kaylin Arrowwood. Um, we saw firsthand what an incredible thing, what an incredible gift it truly was. I felt that was, that was basically my calling in life. I actually started working for the agency um, that procured my daughter's tissues. My job, along with my team members, was to go out to recover bones, skin, veins, heart valves, research tissues, 
at the basic level of what we're doing to the body, it is a very physical, and I imagine some would say a very grotesque thing. I mean, we're, we were pulling out arm bones, we're pulling out leg bones, we're, we're cutting the chest open to pull the heart out to get at the valves, we're peeling veins off the inside of skin. It, it, I guess you'd say it's, it's actually a very brutal procedure. And we would use the PVC pipe that was provided to us from the processing companies. That's an industry standard that if you take the upper and lower leg bone that you use PVC pipe to put back in there and then the funeral director would then do the closing and get the body prepped and ready to go for a viewing if the body was slated for a viewing. You know, everyone wants to be a nonprofit. Everybody thinks it's a, it's a very altruistic business and everyone's doing, yes, it, it is, it's a gift. But uh, let's not make any mistake about it. Money is being made in this industry. Uh, well-needed industry. Even though they may have nonprofit status, their processing facilities are all, all publicly traded companies. Publicly traded companies are in it to make money and to, to make a profit. Everybody receives a cut from the facilities where the procedures are being taking place, to the couriers, to the staff that's doing it, to the operations, to the, the processing folks. The only people that don't have any monetary gain are the donor families. The company that we shipped our, our skin to actually had awards for the procurement techs that could recover the most skin on any particular donor. In all honesty, that's what kind of started me thinking this isn't right. You know, when you're sitting in a staff meeting and, and you're awarded, the, it was called the Golden Dermatome Award for getting as much skin as you could off a donor. It's just wrong. I have nothing against a company, a tissue bank or a tissue processing company wanting to earn a profit. What I am saying is I want that choice and I don't think that's what families are getting. Unfortunately, we cannot guarantee who the tissue would go to. I think we sort of take it for granted uh, for uh, cereal that you buy at a store that it has a barcode on it and it can be tracked back if there's some sort of a problem with it in terms of quality. You can't do that with tissue right now and that is a gap. Got a letter from the uh, New York State Department of Health and uh, it said in there that the uh, bone part that was in my neck uh, came from this cadaver and this cadaver was uh, positive for hepatitis C and um, that was pretty much how I found out that there was something wrong with it then I, I was like you know what's going on and then I found out more. Hale endured monthly blood tests for a year but luckily he didn't test positive for hepatitis C. We really don't know how often this happens because I think it's very, very difficult uh, to identify these tissue transmitted infections. The patients sometimes are unaware that they're getting tissue of human origin. And I think that's absolutely critical that they know that because I think it's every patient's right to know that they're getting tissue from another person. And that doesn't always happen. So when they get an infection, they don't necessarily tie it to the tissue that they got. It's very important to determine traceability, and here's where I think there's a real gap, because the tissue bank can tell us where they distributed the tissue to as far as the facilities, but they can't always tell us where the tissue got implanted and how many patients got implanted. It is a problem when there are investigations and there's a recall, and we have to find all these tissues either in patients or um, stored. I think public health's been lucky, and I think uh, uh, the public's been lucky.